Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Future Proofing Your Career Series. My name is Yolanda. I'm a career and leadership coach. Today, I have Natu Loshenda with me. Um, Natu is the ex-CTO and co-founder of CredReal, a fintech startup in Africa backed by SoftBank. His decades long professional journey spans six cities, two continents, and diverse roles ranging from the world's leading cloud provider to dynamic data startups. He's the data-driven technologist specializing in AI, machine learning, analytics, and distributed systems. So I know Natu is, you know, he has co-invented co a, pa a patent. He has published in journals and contributed to open source software. Um, and he is an active speaker, a published author on machine learning within international publisher. And Natu thrives in collaborative environments where passionate teams tackle complex challenges that positively impact the world. Inspired by the belief it always seems impossible until it's done, Natu strives to bring innovation and a sense of purpose to his endeavors. So I really love this last, you know, this quote that you believe in. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? And where actually, where did that come from? Oh yeah, that's very interesting. So this is like Mandela's signature quote, like, uh, like when, like you say, was fighting against apartheid in South Africa in the 27 years. Mm -hmm. So like, it's actually, I stole this quote from him. I shouldn't, I should probably, uh, refer to it. Like, so it seems impossible until it's done. It's just like something that really resonates with me, like, because really definitely a lot of things do seem very hard <laughs> before they are suddenly done magically. Yeah. Right. Can you share one example of, you know, things that went that way that seemed impossible and then later was magically done? Yeah, that's a hard question. So like, that's what I feel in most of the projects that I'm involved. Like, let's say, uh, I would say like writing the book or solving, like, or, or, or writing software. Sometimes it seems like it's impossible and it's just a very hard project to crack down just yeah. because the nature of complexity, like, let's say, particularly like, let's say, I would say the book, it's like, I signed the book because it seemed like an interesting topic, but it seemed like almost uh, impossible <laughs> to get through the process and, the, and while the, in the process, it was just so daunting and so draining, but like suddenly <laughs> after some time, it was not that. <laughs> well, the hard is to actually get started if you were seeing that as the whole oh, sure. possible. Oh yeah. So how did I get started? So like, uh, yeah, I would go many years ago, maybe when I was, I don't know, nine, 10 years old as everyone that wanted to look, uh, to like, I, I enjoyed computer games. Mm. And I start being curious, like how this works, <laughs> like I want to create my own games. So I entered the rabbit hole of the internet and trying to understand how to create games while I was still in like, let's say middle school, I would say, uh, yeah. And like, I was just like learning these things that I didn't understand, just complex things. I did spend hours and nights trying to understand. And then this thing goes, oh, like after all this part, then there is this small part of the games that's called artificial intelligence. And I got also curious, what is artificial intelligence? And at that time, it was something very simple. It was just basically the rules of the game, the AI of the game. So like, and then like, obviously these went, I went into a rabbit hole, like over many years trying to develop games, like uh, as a side hobby, yeah. uh, like high school. And, uh, yeah, at a given point, I suddenly just, uh, uh, yeah. And at, at a given point, I was also had to make a decision around my career and went into computer science as it's obviously, but the AI thing started like because of games and I, and like, I think serpently or magically, I landed into a neural networks article, uh, <laughs> like, but I'm saying 25 years ago, maybe, oh no, yeah, 20 years ago or something like that. Yeah. So I went into like, let's say articles that were like mentioning AI and neural networks. And then I became kind of obsessed and it just like became uh, like intermingled with my studies as well. And I started, uh, yeah, uh, like finding it interesting. And I obviously, 
uh, like, could never get a job at writing <laughs> video games as I wanted <laughs> and, uh, like, uh, started my career working on, uh, on, on normal software development mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, like founded a startup doing software development. My initial intention was to create a games company, uh, like, but it, it, it revealed as being something very, Sorry. This, Edan, so after you graduated, the first thing you did was to go ahead and found a company. No, while at school. I started at school. It was at school. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. So I, I had this belief that it was possible to create a games company because uh, I'm, I'm originally from Mozambique and there were no games companies in Mozambique. So, and then I realized that <laughs> because I didn't know anything about business, like it, it was just a very ridiculous idea and need to do day to day software jobs. It was just like, <laughs> like interesting and paying, paying the bills. So I did spend a couple of years, um, uh, working on like, uh, starting to, like working on that startup and, uh, like yeah, five years or something like that. And then like, obviously it went bust, uh, and then, um. Uh, yeah, I had to go after a job after some time. And so I started working on the data space in a biomedical, in the biomedical space. So I let like on the data backend of like mm, vaccine trials in a remote side for malaria vaccine. So that was like quite interesting where like, let's say I started working with data. And then from there, I went to study in South Africa. And then from South Africa, I ended up being hired by Amazon and I was working on the initial data and AI projects. And, uh, and then like, let's say that's how my career started. And from Amazon, I started working in a couple of startups, mm -hmm. uh, like yeah, up to yeah, the moment where I, um, I, uh, joined, uh, uh, like let's say, uh, joined Cred Rails and, and started, yeah, working on, 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 on this startup. Yeah. That, that's a summary of my career, more or less. Yeah. 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 Thanks God for giving the summary. And then, you know, it feels like there's a lot in there's Arha, there is Amazon, then quite a few different paths. So later, I think it'd be nice to, uh, and yeah. how, how you actually make some of the pivots, how you made some of the hard choices. Um, sure. but I think for, if I kind of circle back a little to the main objective of today's conversation is that a context where People I would call as, you know, people like me, we are all finders of AI. We don't, I mean, at least we have people who don't deal with AI day in, day out. But yep. it's just, I mean, with Gen AI, suddenly everyone has access to, you know, AI. We have a lot more exposure <laughs> to it compared to, you know, you know the, in the earlier phase when AI was referred to, you know, people would know their algorithms and we didn't know, you know, we didn't need to know much about it. Or yeah. anything is it so much so the this question is really for people who are insider like you right how do you see what what is happening because right now a lot of people are experiencing a bit of an you know both anxiety and excitement so excitement about it is a new era a lot of things are going to be done differently anxiety is about what does it really mean for us in terms of business, in terms of uh, our own career, so job security, well, I still have a job right in the five years time. So a lot of those thoughts, and it comes back to, for me to also get our different perspectives from people in different positions, right? And I would like to understand, you know, how do you see what is happening? Yeah, no, like uh, I definitely have the same anxieties as everyone. Like I'm seeing it from the front line. Uh, in the sense front line in some way not completely in the front line but like uh yeah like every business want to adopt an ai strategy and a lot of like people are also like with some anxiety how our work will change and uh like and and uh, as an insider on the field i'll have to tell you like the things are happening by the minute if you're not on twitter you don't know what are, what is the new capability and what is happening and like what are the new things. So this is like uh, like it's it, it feels very dynamic and sometimes unsettling as well. And you definitely like let's say I think it's it's common ground. I, I don't think there's difference between insiders and mm -hmm. uh, people on the outside. Like it's everything is is moving very dynamically. 
Mm. But the way I see it so far, like I do see a lot of hype, particularly on startups, mm. like uh, on new startups, mm. and uh, like also hype from a business perspective, uh, companies uh, trying to adopt and push employees to use most of the tools. And as a user of the tools, they are extremely useful. And obviously they accelerate work so I can quickly obviously craft documents, discuss ideas and write code much faster than in the past. So all in all, like at this stage, I'm just seeing it being positive. Like it's there, it's definitely frenetic and, uh, one to keep abreast, like you, you, you like I, I get distressed every day. Oh, this is now possible. Okay. I don't need to do it in that way. I can try out, but obviously there's a lot of hype. So what I see so far is like particularly specific areas like support are the first areas being disrupted probably because like chatbots, they, they can allow uh, a better customer service in some way. So like, you don't need like uh, a lot of people to serve like, um, uh, knowledge needs or to get information, you can have more intelligent chatbots. So I see potential disruption in coding specifically. Uh, I don't see replacing engineers, but I see more caution on hiring in the sense of maybe we don't need a, that match into uh, like a big number of engineers with the tools, like the teams that we have, that they can do either. They can do more or we, we don't need to hire more. I don't see, I don't see like currently any big thoughts on uh, reducing teams and, uh, because like a lot, when I see, and I see a lot of these demos online, when I see a lot of these demos and then you, you start like going to the detail, they are relatively shallow at, uh, at this stage. They're very interesting concepts where, right? for instance, like if you look at, uh, let's say Devin is the, the, a, the coder AI. It's a good example. And everyone thought, okay, it's all over. <laughs> the video demo is very beautiful, but when you look at the details, it can, it, it can accurately transform a description into a usable, uh, piece of code and project 13% of the time. Mm. So that's, that's not a big number at the moment, but yeah. directly you see something changing in there. Definitely. So mm. it might not be, <laughs> it might not be too. It might not be today or tomorrow and just quoting a movie again, but soon and for the rest of our lives, like something will change on, on these areas that we thought that would have taken much more time. So I definitely see like longer term, not like at the short, medium term, I see productivity gains, like mm. a rising rate for everyone, deflectionary on products and goods to produce software. Mm. But at longer term, I see these toolings taking more and more of the work. Initially, the grant work, uh, while uh, the teams will be smaller and mm. obviously getting more. And uh, gradually, like, I still think it's up for stakes and debate if they can take a more, like, sentient level of things. Okay, mm. decide what's the best thing for the world and whether we will like hand over the government of the world to open AI <laughs> or to generate AI. I, I, I really don't see. And even when you look at the, at the founders of the area, mm. like the confusing thing is that there is no standard, uh, like let's say the three founders, like uh, people generally call the three mosquitoes that won the, the Turing prize. The, the three of them are in different spectrums of the story. One of them called Jeff Intern is like on the other term, like it's all over. I even like he, he retired recently from Google. It's all over. These AIs will be smarter than us. We will, we will need to be doing other things and we need to protect ourselves. So, and you have another guy called Jan Likan that's the chief of AI at, at, Need, at Meta. He says it's all, um, it's all BS. These are just basically better calculators. And you have people in the middle, like trying to understand the impacts and like, and, 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 and when you see the leaders of the field, like in, in opposite directions, you see that there is no clear answer to these things. So like, it's, it's like, and everything is basically a personal opinion at this stage. <laughs> is it correct to say you are also in the middle? 
Uh, it depends on the time of the day that you talk with me <laughs> in the last two that I've seen. Like, let's say after, like, let's say I currently most, the best music that I can do now, it's actually not like not on Spotify. It's on one of these tools. Like it's the music that I hear the most now I create by myself. Mm. And, and and I've never created music in the past. So like, this is when I get confused, like, because <laughs> the music is so good. But if you understand what they're doing is mm. they are actually like, if you look, so within the leadership of AI, so like, let's say the, the mental models that they use is that these AIs are basically a compassion of knowledge in the world. And, uh, and, and and the point is that like can this compression of knowledge create completely new knowledge? This is questionable. Possible, it can, or it's just like a synthesization of everything that we're doing. And if we stop doing this, like and the AIs take control, like there won't be anything interesting coming up. So like so it's that's why it's it's I would say it's confusing. If, if I catch you at the time of the day when you are having fun with the new music, what I, I prefer the, I think, I think it's all over. We humans need like universal basic income. You will make them, it's all over. And then what other part of the day you are going to be with me on the on Saturday? When I need to do work, like because these tools are not there yet. There's still a lot that I need to do. And in all honesty, like, let's say the, the capability to plan and have agency, I still see it in humans and I can't easily see like mm -hmm. an agent that like kind of synthesized world, uh, synthesized information and thus like interpolation can actually do the leap to start having agency and things like that. But I'm not excluding that, like, but the problem is that I don't see it. Yeah, still so range of possibilities, but highly improbable. But like, I think there's still like for me at this stage, like when I'm like when I do the work and I try to use AI, I think they are like fantastic, fantastic calculators. Like, let's say, like if 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 I, if, if if this analogy makes sense. So in the past, you had like human computers, like in the forties, and in World War, like most of them women. <laughs> The real computers, <laughs> and that's where computer science, as you know, comes from. And then, like, we have calculators now. You don't need to do these calculations. You can you, 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 like I, I see that the like the current AI tools being on that spectrum. And so it's really interesting, and I, I like how you say you know it depends on the time of the day, or rather, you know, yeah. down the subject matter, right? Yeah. And that's how we we have been seeing AI is so profitable in something like it's like superior. Yeah. And then it's quite silly and something else, right? And it really depends, varies a lot. Yeah, and the and the strange thing is not exactly the way we we humans thought that the the AI would be like having an edge. I always thought that the AI would have an edge on a more non artistic things, more menial things. Like I, I first definitely thought on robotics. That's what Hollywood teach us. Like there'll be robots and things like that. I never thought that music, like I would be just like uh, like amazed by the music that they uh, creates. Maybe because also I can put lyrics about me, so that's cool, <laughs> or about my kids and impress them. But uh, like I I don't know. Like so it's uh, like so what I'm feeling is that like it's not working as the human mind, like the, the normal humans thought that this would would take place. Like you you I first thought that it would be like more secretarial tasks or less like cognitive, like I, uh, less uh, like high level cognitive tasks, but it's happening in very strange spaces. It's in art, it's in coding. Mm. And it's like in some ways, uh, like high quality. And I would say accounting, even financial trading, like trading, like let's say, uh, so one of my hobbies now, it has been for a couple of years, is uh, it's, it's, it's a data science competition called Numerai. It's basically trading with AI. So AI is like there's no way that a human can 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 beat AI basically on trading at least like uh, uh, like basic optimizations. So and this, yeah. So there's a natural. I wonder if you know, as an outsider, my very limited understanding here is that you're not that much of an outsider. You have a computer science degree, you like that? <laughs> oh, well, I'm not. I mean, I've not been in the field developing something or training the algorithm, okay. right? 
Uh, and my understanding conceptually is that this AI infused is generally I feel more like, you know, a big dreamer who, who had a huge amount of uh, training patterns and, you know, like yeah. they are given a lot of training ways and then they learned patterns, but then they are essentially what they, who they are, they are dreamers. They kind of connect the dots in a very random and imaginative way, which is why we humans need to step in to supervise that because these dreamers can go out of control and they just connect to dots and say, you know, this other pattern is and they're not too, right? That's why they have us in it so much. So that's, that's my understanding that it was very different from the previous generation of AI. No, I don't think, like, I think this technology, like, is, the, it is, is basically the same. We just have scaled it. Like, like, let's say, we just have compute to allow the calculations and have bigger networks to finish. So we always had these dreamers, but I also think the dreamer effect is questionable <laughs> in there. <laughs> Like, let's say it's, it's, it's statistical. Like, so yeah, maybe he like, yeah. So there's a lot of people that thinks that like the human brain as like, it's, it's also like that. Like, yeah. So, because like, if you look at what generative models do, it's very simple. Now they predict the, the most probable word, word, next word before right. the current mm -hmm. opens. Mm -hmm. So like the, like the more, the bigger believers in AI think that that's probably one approach for like how the brain could work or, or can work. But obviously the people on the other side of the spectrum, like there's not enough context in there to actually have a mental model of the world. And, and there is like, let's say between the leaders of AI, just like a, a, a big rift, like let's say on, on, on that space. There's people that believe that yes, the prediction of next word means that like it's intelligent enough to synthesize all the information that it received and can, yes, be creative and generate dreams and all these things. Mm. But, uh, for, for like, for the more, like, let's say for the more, for, for the other camp that like really doesn't believe that this means a lot, it's more high. It, it they even call this speech language models, like, um, uh, probably stochastic parrots. That's the name. So it's just like a parrot. <laughs> yeah, it, it's useful. It can be useful. Like let's say a parrot can, can do a conversation. Mm. You, if you see that there's a, a parrot on the other side, you can suspect there's a person and you can maybe follow instructions. That's fine, but it's still a parrot. Mm. Really interesting. So in your work, uh, was there a clear line, like which year, you know, which projects you were on the previous generation of AI and then from which time onwards you switch into a different gear? Yeah, so I think everything happened in November 2022. This is what, <laughs> like, basically, like, let's say, for me, it started gradually. It started earlier before everyone, like, kind of started. So let's say in 2018, I worked in a language model project, like some pro bono activity that I do on the AI, AI space. So we were trying to create a, a chat bot of a therapist, like of a PTSD therapist in an organization called Omdena, and I even published an article on that and things like that. But it's the same technology. So it's this language model, but none of us in the AI community or people that were working with these things thought like big things. Like, so whenever there was this transition from AI being more on the, like, let's say on the technical side to like a product like ChatGPT, where people could realize it, is that people has realized so like poetry, like, uh, uh, like, uh, um, like, uh, capability of writing poetry, like Shakespeare. I, I remember seeing this since 2016, AI playing games, 2016 with it mine in all the conferences, this was like easy peasy. It was already there. So for me, the shock is like, okay, this is so impressive. Like it, it was like when, when open AI produced a product that people could use and could see. And the human mind started amplifying <laughs> the consequences of that. Like, because even if you look at, if, when you listen at interviews from OpenAI, they are all shocked how the world is taking this. You are saying that humans are actually hallucinating and by connecting the dots and yeah. <laughs> taking it too far. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I can see the impact, like the business impacts, like let's say, and, and, and the creativity that it involves. So for me, it's, 
like let's say I saw these things for the first time in 2017. I saw something changing, but the 2022 November was not because like the technology changed. I knew about these technologies four years previous, like they existed and things that the road caught, like, yeah, this thing can write code, but it was always bad. But only when they, it was in the hands of like everyday people, like it, it became apparent that something has changed. And the uh, like and, and 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 the imagination of the world has changed. And obviously investments in the area and everyone wants to talk about AI all the time now. So to speak, you know, when it comes to the human world, our imagination plays a huge part, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. it comes from imagination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So everyone is waiting for, you know, the election results. Because after yeah. election results come out, our imagination will lead us to decide to spend more or to, or to save more. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. It's very interesting. So it's about our imagination with what AI really is and what that impact could be, including what you say, you know, companies are becoming a bit more cautious about hiring maybe at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and the companies are becoming cautious because of a mixture of high and also like, let's say, interesting capabilities coming on. So they, they know what's the right, they don't know what's the right, how to right size the investment and the better they are. Yeah. So this, what I think is a really hard question. I know you probably don't have the answer, but I'm just kind of trying to split the hair here, right? Um, sure. You mentioned the word high. A few times, and I think that my my take on hype means because our brain connects the dots, and then we imagine things, and then we you know we take it too far. So it's not the truth, right? And I can't. Huh? So I, I I I think hype, and like let's say mm -hmm. the actual value of the technology orthogonal in some in some cases so like they you can have hype in the in the technology still being as valuable as the hype imagines like so I'm, I'm not saying hype in a negative way like something can be hyped and the ai can really happen as well like like let's say it's it's like when i say hype i'm not saying it in the negative sense like, okay. Uh, what I'm I'm uh, thinking is that hype means it's more than what it actually is today. It might be a potential in the future, but it is at this point of time, it's more than what it really is. Is that the right understanding here? I think yes, but don't get me like let's say things can still be like there is hype, mm -hmm. but. Uh, the a the, the like you said the AI technologies can also be advancing at the same time. Mm. So how do I? So what's the opposite of high? I think it will be like fraud. I don't think it's fraud. <laughs> so what? Like is, yeah. So it may not be high, and it's not true, but it is something that is still moving. But yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's not the same, right? So reality and high. Still are two different things. Yeah, yeah, there right? is. Outstanding. Uh, uh, like, then, yeah, there is a gap, but like, what I'm saying is that the gap is not that big. Like, let's let's say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there, there's somewhat accurate as what they're saying. Something can be happening. <laughs> like, I'm not sure how accurate. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, so? I'm what I'm trying to get at is. Then what is, is it important for us to understand which part is being hyped and yeah. which part is really the current real capability yeah. and what is the real potential in the next yeah. four years? Because I think end of the day, we, we all are living in this world of uncertainty, right? So yeah. the, the more we are able to get to the more, you know, a little bit more nuanced reality picture, the easier for us to navigate or to decide on our strategy. Sure. Uh, yeah. And, and again, this is not like, let's say across kind of like, like it's a definitive answer and I'm not giving praying the gospel or anything like that, but I would say that like, let's say, yes, assume that there is hype, but there is like real change, technological change ongoing as well. 
So in my opinion, everyone should like, let's say, see how these tools can help them. Because I think like the, the successful professional in the next 30 years will definitely need to be working like with AI as we work with computers. Like it's, it's kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so tell me a bit more about just now you mentioned that you also carry this anxiety. Um, how do you cope with that? How do you adjust and make sure that you are staying ahead of the game? Oh yeah. So definitely for me, it's tons of reading, uh, and tons of reading. And I, and on my side is a bit more technical thing. So I'm just like following a lot of these open source projects and like the basic socials, Twitter and things like that. But for the specific projects on my area where I'm particularly interested, let's say I'm interested in software development. So I look at the open source implementations of the products that will disrupt my area. So for instance, like there is Devon, that's kind of like the automated software system, but there's always like, and like, uh, because like there's a lot of, a big grassroots movement on the AI of like bringing AI to the public, like that believes that like, like AI capabilities should be driven to the public and should not be on the hands of like big corporates because it would just like create the digital divide. So there are always open source movements on many areas. So I, I try to be, stay abreast on that area. I can't know everything, but like, uh, there are two open source communities that you can always join in your area and you don't need to always be technical. Sometimes you can just be looking at what's happening on the area. For instance, like one that I'm just following now, it's a community called, um, open Devon. So it's just like, uh, like, let's say automating the software developer. So where you just give a description and it does everything like just, uh, like like, let's say what's as a product manager, let's say like you as a product manager, like you just put a task and it, it does everything for you. Like that's the dream, but like, that's what this kind of community is building the open source alternative, but there are open source alternatives in different areas that you can always that's really, Yeah. How does it work? So now we know that AI needs a lot of like, you know, in, in the future, people to work on ethics and boundaries, like even in music, right? There's copyright yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and also what other things we don't want to sort of um, in Jagas, you know, um, like poison to the AI content and all that. We need people to to be the guardrails. And how would that work for open source communities? Uh, so I I would think that on open source communities, that's easier to do that because, like, let's say a lot of the data sets that I that we that are used are public data sets. So like, it's just like. Uh, in the open source community, I think it's better because you can actually inspect the data. Where it's dangerous, in my opinion, is on 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 on, on public companies where the data sets are protected by by by, by IP laws and and corporate uh, uh, legal issues where you can't see what's on the data. On that aspect, like it's it's a complete like it's it's a complete kind of like gray area. You really don't know if ethics and all these important things around, even sometimes to regulation, legal issues, uh, where they can care of. So there's no transparency. Exactly. So by empowering open source and contributing, you, 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 you ensure a counterbalance on, on, on the world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, otherwise companies also have their own political or other agenda behind that. Right. And the AI turns out all those content, yeah. but I, I thought, thought, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Because that's what, what's currently happening. So what's happening is that like a company can kind of spend like, um, let's say for instance, OpenAI is spending, I don't know, $1 billion in training their model. But um, one good thing that is happening is that some companies are uh, kind of creating open source models just to reduce the, in some way, the, um, the competitive advantage of OpenAI in some way. So, oh, okay, this is now open. So they, they actually don't open source everything, but they open source the weights. It's just a starting point. And one question that has been kind of, uh, making me quite curious. I heard some people in the tech industry say that, you know, in the recent years, it's been, um, the, the, the way of working, the way of the team are uh, becoming very different, especially the, the kind of uh, attachment between employer and employee has become 
quite much more loose than before. So there is a lot of, a lot more frictional work, even at a very senior level, et cetera. So I don't know if that's something you experience and do you see that getting sort of uh, uh, more amplified with, you know, the technology or AI kind of change? I think so, because management might think that like, let's say, um, uh, like employees are more fungible now. Let's say <laughs> it's uh, like my manager can, can think like, oh, okay, <laughs> we have all these hype uh, AIs that are saying that can do your work. Uh, and like, uh, look at this, uh, maybe <laughs> uh, like we can replace you with something cheaper that can work 24 seven and doesn't need to rest. And, and we don't need to pay all the, <laughs> yeah. all the bills that we just need to pay electricity and GPUs for it to be happy to work and can work like 24 hours a day. Mm. Doesn't have even stick it, yeah. yes. <laughs> right, and it hypes are kind of influencing our judgment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, particularly at the management level, because uh, like, let's say, there might not be like awareness of what is the right timing for the technology displacement. So the, te the technology displacement will eventually happen what you're doing now in 100 years will not make sense. Everything, I think most of the things that I, you, you are doing with any technical tool in 100 years, we are sure that they will be different. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll... Not in 100 years, right? Like I remember, it... yes, when I started uh, learning computer science, I was some of our biggest genius. They were learning, uh, that they, they were still able to do boss and, and like, what is that? It's ridiculous. Right? <laughs> that doesn't make they... sense that just like it's already gone <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you know it it can even be a liability like it's no one needs it. <laughs> so yeah yeah and the other day i was uh i was talking to someone who was saying you know in the in the university students are asking uh, students in computer science they're like do we still need to learn coding and of course there is from our generation the, the sort of most instinctive answer is, of course, you need to learn how they at least have some idea so that you can do the debugging and, you know, troubleshooting, right? But the other day I was reading, you know, there's by a professor in school saying that he doesn't know coding. But then he asked AI to teach him how to code and how to, not, not teach him how to code. He asked AI to code and asked AI to walk him through on how to debug. Yeah. No, and it is, it, that's something like completely possible for people who actually have zero coding background to leverage on AI to close that for loop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you, you can have today start up, uh, startups founded by technical founders that don't know how to code. Today, it's quite possible. Like there are tools that allow you to, to just st stitch two tools together, AI or like, yeah. But it's that, yes, go ahead. But that's why I don't think it's only AI. It's just like normal modernization. So, for instance, I I see like normal, like let's say normal evolution of society. Obviously, there is always like, like that, that's why the high part that I'm saying it's also in some way related with marketing as well. Like society will evolve naturally, but maybe with AI we will evolve faster in a, in a direction, and like and it's a catalyst for it's a catalyst. But in all fairness, I think like in the problem is that all all predictions are like are up 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 for grabs at this stage. But mm -hmm. like in all fairness, like let's say transitions in 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 the job force are not fast. They they take years, like maybe five years, maybe like so. It always gives you time to prepare. So people should definitely be prepared, but like, let's say we didn't move from agriculture to industry in, in, in industrial, uh, like, uh, industries in, 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 in five years, like it took time. So, yeah. But can I just, uh, kind of make sure I'm understanding you or there's, you know, taking away the right learning here. It's about the. It's like we all will die, <laughs> but yeah. we're not doing. We all will die, right? Everyone and friends. 
right? But that is not so immediate. So we can't live our immediate life with that as a guidance. Yeah, yeah. Directionally, it's important to influence us. Like you, 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 you like and using that analogy, you you start taking care with you with what you eat, with doing exercise and all these things. Maybe now, like if we're talking in AI, you need to do much more exercise. Like you need to know exactly what's happening on your specific area. And potentially in some cases, you you need to start doing new things because like there'll be more, like let's say, like high cognitive loads, load things to do. And there will definitely be cases where like, yeah, uh, uh, like uh, a specific job will not be needed. But it doesn't mean that, like, let's say you'd be jobless, maybe for some time, but people will, will retrain. Yeah. But, but people will figure this out as it's, as it's happening. Like, you know, it's just something, it's, it's good anxiety, but you can always counterbalance that anxiety by staying informed on your field. Yeah. So it, 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 what I'm sharing is like, it is a big leap, but it's not like that huge a leap that we will not be able to catch up. So that there is still time for us to yeah. move. It's not moving as fast as the hype goes, but it is yeah. moving fast. So try to dance along, try to, yeah. you know, still. But I think it's, it, when you said that sentence, I felt very reassured. Like, it, you know, it will always give you enough time to respond to. This is not yeah. like suddenly it just comes and destroys everything and we are left hopeless, right? And it's not the case. We, we need that level, some level of confidence to say, you know, uh, even for a change that big, it will take time to happen. Yep. That's, yeah. I think it's, I think it's a good, yeah, uh, distillation of, of my thinking. Yeah, I agree with you. And what you, how do you see, you know, let's say not in immediate terms, but in, let's say, midterm, where the change, the impact is being felt a lot more, where displacement would be already happening, right? How would the organization at that point of time be different from today in terms of team setup, in terms of culture? Yeah. So I think, uh, like I'll go to culture next, but from a culture perspective, you would need to do, like, let's say we, as humans will be doing what AI can't do the best. It's, it, I think it will be more like if we look at IQ and EQ, we'll need to tend to the spectrum of EQ because these that are highly technically defined and are more like, let's say procedural and algorithm will, will change. Like, so you will need to be more conceptual. You will need to have more agency ownership and playing more on your soft skills. Definitely will be more important. Probably you'll get out of, from the university and the definition of junior will be very different. The definition of junior of the future might be a junior that thinks in new business, proposes things to the board. So I think. <laughs> That kind of seniority will be fast tracked because, uh, like the, the, the work on the, on the bottom side of the company on the grant work will be commoditized. Like let's say writing a report, no junior will need to write a report. We have our AI juniors, no junior will need to run calculations and even comparing reports, like you need to be planning new things, be. And again, that's where the creative part will come and like, and, and, and use like these things that are unique to the humans, like, let's say this EQ, emotional intelligence, because at the end of the day, we are serving, humans are serving humans and the planet and yeah. That's a very, very intriguing future, right? For juniors at that age, they need to be like, you know, like, is it Greta, Greta? Than the bar. More strategic, like yeah, yeah, more strategic than like let's say. And these are the kind of like of things that I think need to be instilled maybe in primary schools. But I see primary schools today is kids doing presentations, projects, thinking deep about problems. So, <laughs> <laughs> five years old, like with <laughs> with <laughs> with inquisitive minds trying to change the world. I think like let's say and more entrepreneurial as well. Because like it will maybe less formal jobs and more like entrepreneurship as well as we move. Mm -hmm. 
And let's say you are this person who can travel, right? Into this, and now you become a teenager in in the university. How would you actively prepare with for the future for yourself? Yeah, I wouldn't just study technical areas as I've done in the past because what will happen is that, like, let's say, I think the 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 AI and the computing part will be more like a calculator of our area. I would try to find an area where I like I'm let's say relatively passionate and uh, and like obviously it needs to also be an area that there is some intersection. People would pay for that area. But it, it needs to be like it can't be I wouldn't go again to computer science. Like that would be a big mistake because this is the most popular a degree at the moment and it's like you actually need to know have a domain area of expertise like uh, let's say i would go to maybe i don't know biology finance or one of these areas and obviously join it with uh, computing like uh, the, the, the brain amplifier but i would stress on that domain expertise because that domain expertise is what will be kind of important it will be the boundaries the nuances of that specific area and yeah, so you're saying go higher and go broader. Yeah, yeah, a mix of it, yeah. Yeah, so the yeah. different domains can also intermarry. And yeah. it's not like a, it, that the other domain, you do need to also go quite deep as well, right? In order to marry this other, this computer domain. Yeah, I think a computer domain is an accessory and not the main player, the, the, the computing domain. That's my my point of view. It's an access. Find a domain that you're passionate about and mm -hmm. invest in that domain. Mm -hmm. Because the computing part will always be with you. you. You still need to know. But like, let's say I would find a domain. For me, it will be like potentially today. I think it will still be finance just because I'm just fascinated by how it works and uh, like, like different. Yeah. But maybe biology for some people. Uh, but like, and and obviously couple that domain with computing abilities because that is what will give you an edge. Yeah, so I think that's that's interesting. There's this idea about AI is good at task and humans are good at problem solving. So for us to be irreplaceable is for us to be more connected to problems or possibilities yeah, yeah. or bigger. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'll go one step further. Like more than problem solving is problem definition as well. Like mm. you need to, like, let's say, like understanding what's the mo what's the most important problem to solve is the most important skill more than your more than your problem solving skills, because your problem solving will be in some way kind of catered by 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 the tools depending on the area. Yeah, that's really interesting. And to be able to define problems that requires us to have a certain yep. capability on the sort of a breadth, not only depth. And yeah. to, to understand the world in a connected yeah. way, yeah. and it's kind of quite a difficult transition for 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 us humans actually. Because I think what happened in the past few decades was about us going hyper specialized. Yeah. yeah, the world was defining so much, like almost to the extent like every job was becoming unique. Right. Every job in a different company was so unique because we are all going hyper niche. And steadily now with all these changes, we are not only going to need to be, you know, niche specialized in something. We also need that kind of breath and be a world citizen. How difficult is that? Very. <laughs> yeah. Very. But, but, but that will be my bet for the future. And obviously never forget things like philosophy, ethics. Because, like, I think philosophy by nature gives you always, like, let's say, this kind of cross-cutting. Let's say I completely ignored humanities on my training. But these days, I think things like philosophy are very important. Because it, it develops, like, a strategic mindset and, like, understanding and more on your EQ side. Mm -hmm. When you say, when you talk about EQ, what, what comes to your mind? Yes, that's an interesting question. It just reminds me on the coaching sessions, but interesting. <laughs> uh, cool. Uh, so, yeah. So, yeah. EQ basically comes to my mind is more around, like, let's say, uh, uh, culture, leadership, 
handling other humans and uh, your like your your social environment. For me, this is more really like around your emotional perception of the environment. Yes, it does a whole bunch of things, right? Like how our emotional awareness and also our awareness for others and the environment. Is this the only way that you can identify problems? Identify problems in the world, and when you identify problems, it becomes like let's say, as you said, you are in some way you, like uh, we are in the world to solve problems for others. But you need to be able to identify. You need to be able to put yourself in these shoes. Understand and like awareness, and and that's where I put the the emotional uh, like I said that's my representation of EQ emotional quotient. This is really interesting. I think you just inspire me to think this way. That is always about about connection to other humans as a whole, right? So the problem is ours, and eventually to solve for all of this is also ours. It's not only like okay, I alone solve for for all of yeah. So to, yeah. to to that whole definition of problem, to that solving process, everything requires us to stay connected. Yeah. And EQ is, feels like that little, you know, that capability, that enabler to make sure this bridge is going through. Yeah, because that's only when you can understand what are the relevant problems. And I don't want to look transactional here, but what are the valuable problems? Yeah, what is worth it? What is worth it? Oh, what is worth it? Yeah. And, and, and that's a million dollar problem everywhere, like a billion dollar problem. If you identify a problem, you are able to solve, then uh, like, let's say you have a, like, let, let's say a viable business. Yeah. And then it's, that's also, you know, a viable career that's on the back. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it's a consequence. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, every career is also a business. If you think about, you know, we charge. Yeah. So when I look at my career, like as I move the ladder, like, uh, like, let's say the higher I was, the more EQ I had to have. Like, it's just like understanding what is the big problem? How do I like get into the mind of uh, like that user, that consumer, that person, what are they really trying, like, let's say to achieve, what is their values? Well, what is their value system? So it's, it's, I'm looking a bit transactional, but like, I don't know if you can understand me, like it's, there is like a very important factor around like the emotional side, understanding, like, let's say, uh, the social side and what we generally call soft skills in like on the tech side, we generally, uh, this is uh, soft skills, but these are a channel, what I feel as like, uh, like now that I'm just like in leadership positions is just the most important because that's the only way that you discover what is really valuable. Yeah. They, um, I, this is actually very new to me that, you know, it, because having been in the tech side myself, gathering user requirement and all that. Okay. I always thought that a very rational process, but as you talk about it, I, I really see the value, right? To, to also feel, not only to hear, yeah. um, analyze the user requirement, but also to feel if I were him, right? That, that kind of capability to, to, to yeah. take up inside. I think that's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because from a problem perspective, like, let's say these are the things that are, I, I, I don't think they are correctly represented on the text that the AI is used to train. This is what you get from energy or from interacting with humans, with your experience with humans. So like, I still believe that these are like, let's say it's statistical information that's not available on text. Like it's that high layer that we have as humans as connections. Mm -hmm. and, and it can be an edge on how to, or how to like, let's say cope with this new world. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's beautiful, and I still want to push you push you on the hype question. Yeah. So you said that okay, it's happening, but it's just not happening that fast yet. The timing, you know, uh, and I'm wondering, is it really going to happen? Do you think that AI is going to wipe us out? <laughs> is that hype? 
going to happen someday is if you are able, if you have a crystal ball, if you, you try to predict the future today. I think in my head, this is highly unlikely, but like, let's say, um, but let's say I can have two lines of thought in my head. Like the people that I respect in the area, there is people like, let's say like Jeff Hinton that really believe that the AIs can wipe us, can wipe us out. So like, let's say. I, I, in our lifetime, our generation. Yeah, 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 yeah. These guys are like thinking 10 years. <laughs> what but we, we get to live to see that day, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what would be quite interesting. Uh, yeah. So, 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 and, and remember, these are people that uh, like, let's say they invented this area. They, they invented the neural networks. Uh, but like for me, it's, it's like, I don't think so. Like, uh, it, there's like statistically like, but this is again, a very personal opinion and like devoid of any authority in the area. And it's very emotional as well. Like, I don't think so. I'm seeing this as like, let's say, and an, uh, like, let's say an acceleration era of automation. That's what's happening. Like it's an acceleration area, era of automation. And I kind of deal like regularly with AI kind of projects and I've been dealing with it for 10 years. So it's an acceleration area. And if you, if you talk with some of the engineers, like, like it's, it's, it's not like, let's say the hype is big, but it's just an acceleration of automation. So I, I think it's probabilistic. It's, it's, it's technically possible that these things will have like a, like, let's say we'll have a model, like with weights that will decide to, to have agency or something like that. They can technically and decide to do weird things and what uh, as well is probably strictly possible, but it's only unlikely. Yeah. And, and as you talk about that, I was just thinking, right. It's like a car that was accelerating and going faster and faster. So theoretically, if there is no intervention, it can actually escape gravity and go into outer space, right? Become a completely different animal. But on the other hand, that's what you talk about agency, right? There's, there's also the type, there's this runway for humans to work with that. So to regulate that, so that it doesn't go into the outer space. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but, 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 but understand if like, we have an incantation that will, will, will go to outer space it won't be gradual. Like we'll find those weights and <laughs> it will be sudden. <laughs> Yeah, it's also possible, right? Yeah. That possibility is before we catch, we figure out how to catch up with this chip. Yeah. It already went, you know, out of yeah. our control. And that possibility is there. But yeah. nobody will know what it is. Yeah. Knowing yeah. that we can work with it, we can seek agency, uh, we can try to own it, whether or not it will go out of control. We don't know. We don't know. And, and yeah. yeah, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. <laughs> or when you're left. <laughs> yeah, and, and then that at that time, I'm going to be really proud that, you know, I live to see the last generation of Snowflakes or a huge change at that time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like, let's say in, in all senses, and it, I might be cynical because I am, like, I have, like, I, I've been, I've been in the area for a while and I've been seeing a couple of things. It might be just that I'm cynical because, okay, like this, I just know neural networks, you have them bigger and like there are emergency, emergent capabilities, but like, let's say, yeah, statistically it's possible, but it can happen, but, uh, I, I, I really don't think so. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like automation. And, and yeah. most of the times what I see with AI, it's actually more money invested because most of the companies don't have data ready to be used by AI. So you really need humans to prepare data for AI and labeling less these days, but like it is still like a lot of like process work. And what I see from my last 10 years of working in AI is that we generally need more people. We need more engineers. <laughs> we need more data engineers, like different kind of people. Like let's say, but like we need more people. Like this is what I've seen so far, particularly on on the teams that I've worked on. Yeah, and it feels more like you know. You remember when I was preparing for our talk, 
I yeah. had the third title on, you know, AI in diapers or something. So, so the feeling I have is that the outside world is perceiving AI as a superhero ready to disrupt the whole world. And the people inside who has been working with AI have seen it in diapers, have now seen it as a toddler who you know, require a lot of people to feed, to serve, to, to bathe. And it's, it's far from that superhero who is already out there and make people injured. <laughs> but it's a good analogy because it, 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 it can still happen. Uh, yeah, it's a good analogy. I think it's... it's, it's... Yeah, we are still reading that superhero. Yeah, it's, it's not like, I, I would love it to be like, the second light, deep down, I would love to find this super AI, like, <laughs> yeah. uh, like, uh, like, uh, like uh, just from a, like, let's say from a wondering perspective, like, <laughs> I'll be amazed. <laughs> yeah, and it is, perhaps it's quite disappointing, right, when you needed to help something and then it's capable. So far, so far, apart from music, and apart from music and entertainment, has been disappointing for me. Like I need more. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what I saw was that say whatever AI today we are using is going to be the worst version we use in our lifetime. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> in the <change>. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But remember, these same people are the same people that saying AI is almost there. It will kill all of us. It's just because they need to sell their technology. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's the <laughs> that all side of things. Yeah, what a wonderful world. <laughs> ah, <okay. laughs> all right, thank you very much, Natu. I will stop the right party and then we can have a chat afterwards, right? <laughs>